Welcome everyone to Drawing a Portrait of Arts and Culture in the US with public data from NADAC. Let's start with some introductions. Here with us today, we have Dr. Lynette Holter. Lynette is the NADAC director. My name is Anna Ovchinikova. I'm the NADAC project manager. Also here with us today is David Thomas. David is a senior data project manager at ICPSR. I'm excited to introduce our special guest today, Sanil Iyengar. Sanil is the director of the Office of Research and Analysis at the National Endowment for the Arts, which provides funding and support for NADAC. Before we begin, let's take a quick look at our plan for today's presentation. First, Sanil and I will uh, briefly tell you about NADAC and the National Endowment for the Arts. Then we'll talk about the uh, NADAC services and resources. After that, Lynette will take you on a tour uh, around some of NADAC's recent data releases. Our next topics will be to show you how to use the NADAC website to find data, how to analyze data online without uh, downloading data to your computer, how to deposit your data with NADAC. Uh, then we'll talk about upcoming data releases and a quarterly digest of arts research articles and reports, which is a new resource that we're adding to the NADAC website. And in conclusion, we will uh, tell you about available help resources on our website and user support. And at the end, we will welcome your uh, questions and comments, which you uh, can submit uh, in a Q&A box at any point during today's presentation. For those of you who are new to NADAC, NADAC is a national archive of data on arts and culture. Uh, we are a data repository of the National Endowment for the Arts, which uh, provides uh, funding and support. Uh, our archive is produced and managed in partnership with the Inter-University uh, Consortium for Political and Social Research, or ICPSR. ICPSR is the largest social data archive in the world. It is part of the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. And now I would like to invite Sunil uh, to tell you about the National Endowment for the Arts. Welcome, Sunil. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. I want to thank the ICPSR team uh, for all their help in making this possible. Um, if you could stay on the slide, Anna, for a moment. Uh, I thought for those of you who don't know about the Arts Endowment, uh, we're an independent federal agency that supports arts projects around the country in every type of American community, large, small, urban, or rural, to give people opportunities to participate in the arts exercise their imaginations and develop their creative capacities. The office I have the privilege of leading is um, responsible for supporting research into the value and impact of the arts for individuals and communities and for society as a whole. I'm really proud to have this resource available for other res researchers. I just thought I'd just tell you a little bit about our office. If you can go to the next slide, please. As it happens, uh, we're in the middle of, a, of the fifth and final year of a, re of a research agenda we began in 20, uh, 2015 or 2016. At the time, we focused on three broad areas. I'd invite you to look from the left to right here and view these topics as three columns. One on the far left is about what we consider to be the prerequisites or the boosters or inhibitors of a healthy arts ecosystem. What are the preconditions for the arts and for arts participation to flourish? The central column, those two ovals, cover the topics of arts participation and arts and cultural assets for which we typically collect a lot of descriptive statistics such as those you'll see housed on NADAC. Uh, with, we collect those with our federal partners, for example, who participates in the arts, how often, from what socio-demographic -dem backgrounds, uh, or what do we know about our nation's artists and arts organizations. Then finally, the third column, those two boxes on the far right have to do with individual and societal outcomes from arts participation or arts infrastructure whether health-related, social or emotional benefits, or civic and economic, for example. You can go to the next slide, please. Hewing to this agenda, we've strengthened and extended partnerships with federal statistic agency, statistical agencies across the US government. These include the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the Department of Commerce, and the US Census Bureau, but also the National Center of Education Statistics at the Department of Education and the National Institutes of Health. We collaborate with these entities to plan survey questions and to harvest those data for reports that are available on our website, as shown here. Next slide, please. 
Beyond aggregating and analyzing statistics about the arts, we work with several other federal agencies and departments on an initiative called the Interagency Task Force on the Arts and Human Development. <clears throat> this entity meets quarterly to discuss research opportunities and evidence-based projects involving the arts and positive health or educational outcomes across the lifespan. Working with these entities, if you can go to the next slide, please, we've catalyzed new research opportunities for the arts and aging, uh, music in the brain and health, for example, and other domains. We've also issued several research reports in consultation with this group, or sometimes in direct collaboration with them, as shown here. Next week, in fact, we'll be releasing a research report on the arts and the opioids crisis. Next slide. Um, you know, we've, uh, you know, although I've, you know, I previously discussed a lot of the research and analyses we tend to conduct in commission, we're now in the 10th year of a research grants program that serves our office's mission of investigating the value and impact of the arts in American life. These awards range from $10,000 to $100,000 per grant and require a one-to-one -one match in dollars or in-kind support. Application guidelines for the program will be posted to our website in January 2021 with a deadline in March. Can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, next slide, please. So also for the last few years, we've offered another research award opportunity at the Arts Endowment. Titled NEA Research Labs, this program supports transdisciplinary teams of researchers and arts practitioners to develop and implement multi-year research agendas in one of the following broad domains, health and social emotional well-being, creativity, cognition and learning, and entrepreneurship and innovation. These awards, which also require a match, go up to $150,000. They are not technically grants, but cooperative agreements, which, mean, which means they involve greater collaboration with arts endowment staff, and they can be renewed without camp competition. Just last week, in fact, we released a report summarizing proceedings from an NEA Research Lab Summit we held at the Arts Endowment in the summer of 2019 titled Arts Research Practice, sorry, it's titled Arts Research Pract Partnerships in Practice. This report examines cross-cutting themes and opportunities across a cohort of 12 labs. I encourage you to check out our website for it. And with that, um, I'll go back to the main topic of today, which is of course the NADAC repository and I'll turn it back over to Anna. Um, I would also note here that we will be embarking on yet another five-year research agenda development planning process regarding the arts. Uh, we hope to consult with the public for that as well. So thank you very much. Anna? Thank you, Sunil. That was very useful information. And if you have questions for Sunil, here's uh, an email and um, that you can uh, send your questions to. And here's the website uh, for the National Endowment for the Arts uh, Research. Uh, before we move to our uh, next topic, I wanted to make sure that you all know how to find our archive online. Uh, an obvious way is to go directly to our website. Our address is www.icpsr.umich.edu forward slash NADAC. Another quick way is to go through the ICPSR homepage. Uh, as you scroll down, ICPSR has this links to different archives and projects that it manages. And clicking on the uh, NADAC logo will take you directly to our uh, archive. This slide provides a brief overview of NADAC services and resources free, freely available to you on the NADAC website. Again, thanks to the support and funding provided by the National Endowment for the Arts. This includes NADAC public data collection as of today consisting of 139 uh, studies and over 90,800 variables. Uh, which also include 40 union catalogs for which we only provide study level metadata. So those studies are searchable on our website, but we do, we do not provide the data. We point you to the data elsewhere. Uh, for each study, NADAC provides uh, data files in multiple uh, formats for practically any statistical package out there, SES, SPSS, STATA, R. We also provide ASCII and delimited formats, which you can open in Excel. Uh, users can, oh, uh, I should also say that uh, NADAC provides engaging infographics and data visualizations for some of uh, studies in our archive, and we will be using some of them uh, later uh, during this presentation. Uh, um, users can also search data and variables on our site. Um, uh, our website provides online analysis capabilities, in which case you don't need to download the data into your computer to do uh, your analysis. 
There are over 780 uh, bibliographic citations to publications based on the data archived in NADAC that you can search on our site. And the convenience that our site offers is that you can search for publications of interest and have immediate access to related data and variables. And of course, our site provides um, help resources and uh, you can al also reach out to uh, free user support uh, for help with uh, using and understanding research data archived uh, in NADAC. And uh, now Lynette uh, will tell you about some of NADAC's recent data releases. As Anya mentioned, I'm the director of um, the NADAC archive, but I want to preface that by saying I've only been the director for like a month. So if I say something that's not correct, um, don't blame, blame Sumil or Anya, it's all me. Um, I'm gonna talk to you today about some of our uh, recent releases. Um, many of these you'll recognize as parts of larger data collection efforts, um, but we'll tell you a little bit about what makes them special for studying the arts. Um, next slide, Anya. And we should mention these slides will be available and um, Anya put all of the links to each of the, um, the data sets that we're talking about today uh, in that last slide. So when you get the slides, you can just uh, click on the links rather than having to even search our website. Um, the first one that uh, we'll be talking about today is the General Social Survey um, Arts Module. Um, this recently came out. Uh, um, the data were collected in 2016, but you can see here that this is actually part of a long-term um, data collection effort. I think the next slide has um, more information about the general social survey generally. Um, any of you who are in social sciences know that the GSS is one of the long-running um, oft-cited surveys. Um, they ask questions um, going back to 1972, um, and many of the questions are asked repeatedly across those years. Um, it was a yearly survey until um, I think the two th early 2000s, and then it um, became every other year. But the 2016 module specifically um, highlights uh, Americans' um, interaction with the arts. So uh, next slide shows you an example of what you might find in the arts module. Um, it, the GSS asked respondents questions about their attendance at events, um, as well as characteristics of the events, like what type was it, um, who did they attend with, things like that. So um, you can see this is an uh, example of the kinds of um, data visualization that Anya mentioned is, um, can be found on our site. Uh, this one is particularly about um, people's attendance at arts exhibits and live performances. Um, and you can see, uh, probably not surprisingly, that most, um, most of those performances were music. Uh, if you think about the range of music performances compared to even dance and theater, uh, that kind of makes sense. Um, Anya, next slide, please. Uh, the next data set that um, we wanted to mention um, is actually a little bit different than some of the data that ICPSR typically holds. This is the Arts and Cultural Production Satellite Account. Um, and the data that we have here that we're highlighting is from 1998 to 2017. Um, we will, in uh, sometime in early 2021, be getting from NEA the um, the, the most recent two years, so 2018 and 19. Um, so maybe uh, late spring or early summer, look for that um, on the ICPSR website uh, or the NADAC website, sorry. Um, the, the ACPSA um, really is, it's a series of Excel tables. Um, if you wanna jump to the next slide, I think they, uh, yep. You've got some examples of what those tables look like. Um, the goal of this study is, or of uh, these data, are to um, demonstrate the influence of the arts and culture contribution to the economy. So, production of um, various types of art and cultural um, institutions do for the overall gross domestic product, that kind of thing. Um, I think if you move through, uh, Anya, you've got some. Oh, there's more. That's what I was thinking. 
Um, and these are what the, the tables look like. So rather than being available in um, SPSS, SAS data, the typical um, data formats, these are Excel tables. Um, so they're summary statistics um, and easy to digest. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is an infographic based on those, um, those data. So it shows obviously that um, uh, the purple bar is exports, the red bar is imports. Um, the US is pretty good at exporting movies and TV shows, um, as you might expect. Um, but than to export um, jewelry and silverware. So um, just kind of an interesting look at where our, um, our cultural objects come from and go. Uh, next slide, please. And this is another series of infographics um, that just give you sort of a sense of the kinds of things that you might look for in the data. These are, again, the same categories. Um, and looking at the, um, the amount of uh, production for each of them. Um, next slide, please. This, uh, the American Time Use Survey Arts Activities um, module is another part of one of those larger uh, longitudinal data collection efforts. Um, the American Time Use Survey looks at what um, people are doing over a 24 hour period. So it's like a diary kind of study. Um, and this, these data are great for looking at all kinds of different activities, anything from time spent in childcare or education. Um, but specifically on the NADAC website, we have um, any activities relating to the arts. So socializing, relaxing and leisure, um, sports, exercise, recreation. Um, and this is a, an infographic about reading. It would be interesting to um, compare these data to um, similar data collected during this um, COVID period. I'm guessing overall, we all have more time for reading, but you can see here in the infographic um, from 2015, have more time for um, leisure reading than, uh, than the rest of us. And, and if you think about that, that probably makes some sense. Um, next slide, I think, looks at TV watching. Yep. Um, again, quarterly averages, uh, just sort of um, giving a sense of what's going on in U.S. households. Um, again, something that would be will be interesting to see um, when we get data from 2020, um, how that compares with what we were doing in 2015 uh, through 2018. Um, next slide, please, Anya. Um, the Arts Basic Survey is another um, repeated survey. So this is part of the current population survey done through the, the Census Bureau. Um, the National uh, Endowment for the Arts sponsors the Arts Basic Survey. Um, and it really collects information about participation in the arts um, personally. So uh, actually taking part in making music or creating art. Um, Next slide, I think, has an infographic from this one. Yep. Um, you can see that it uh, looks at different types of participation. Um, it's surprising to me that the um, that social dancing is as high as it is. Um, just an interesting that you interesting thing that you can find um, in the data. So, and these are available for earlier years as well. We have the 2014 and 2016 um, participation in the in arts activities um, on the NADAC website as well. Um, this is from the February, I believe it is, supplement of the current population survey. Anya, next slide, please. Um, perfect. So uh, this is again from the, um, Arts Basic Survey, um, just kind of to give you a sense of uh, the kinds of questions or activities that are covered by the data. This one is from 2014. Um, I believe that NADAC actually has the best uh, data graphics on the ICPSR site. Um, don't tell anyone else from ICPSR that I said that, but um, <laughs> next slide, please, Anya. And this is again from those same uh, uh, two uh, different data sets, actually. 
Civic Survey and the Survey of Public Participation in the Arts, um, but on, on similar kinds of questions. So looking at um, who has participated in visiting some of um, the nation's historic sites, um, as well as thinking about uh, neighborhoods and how they're being built up and uh, how that draws people's attention and time um, and how they spend their time there. So um, lots of interesting uh, research questions that can be answered from these kinds of data. Sorry, that's my whiny cat. Um, next slide, please, Anya. She's telling me that I need to talk faster and turn it back over to you. Um, <laughs> The last uh, data set that we'll talk about today is self perceptions of creativity and arts participation. Um, this is a, a really interesting um, data set that looks at the connections among um, creativity via the arts and other um, life skills. So it includes things like social networking, problem, problem solving. Um, it looks at six different uh, creativity uh, domains, what they call domains. And um, I was interested to see that it includes things like creativity in social and civic settings. Um, so uh, lots of things to think about um, and how the arts actually uh, impact um, the way we behave in other parts of our daily lives. Um, next slide, please. Uh, again, just an infographic. This is from one of the um, reports uh, that NEA puts out. Um, this just looks at uh, uh, race and ethnicity um, from that survey. Um, I think that's all I want to say about that one. And this is from, again, that same report um, looks at uh, self participation uh, depending on your educational background. So uh, educational attainment and by income. Um, so kind of looking at uh, standard demographic characteristics and how it's related to um, self perceptions of artistic creativity. Next slide and one more <laughs> um, age. The, the, the last big of the um, demographic characteristics. Next slide, please. And this is a um, this is just a slide that mentions that the data that we've just talked about are not the only recently released data. Um, if you were here for the um, the last webinar, which I believe was in February, or um, Anya's nodding at me, so that's right. Um, these uh, six five or six studies have been released since then as well. So we just didn't. Um, take the time to highlight them all um, because we knew that you probably had other things to do today. Um, but I want to point your attention uh, specifically to um, the last one, the Dunham's data. Um, I mentioned that the, um, that the ACPSA uh, data are slightly different than what ICPSR typically um, holds or puts out. Um, the Dunham's data are equally um, unique and very, very cool. It looks at um, Catherine Dunham was a dancer and kind of her travel um, as she moves throughout the world and teaches and performs um, and works with uh, individual dancers so that you can see the um, big picture impact of her uh, teaching and her um, talent throughout the world um, from 1950 to 1953. So, um, really cool kind of uh, bird's eye look at um, an industry that we don't often get a, a view of. And with that, I believe Anya, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Lynette. That was very interesting. Um, I would like to show you how to use our website to search for data publications and variables. I'd like to show you a couple quick ways. Of course, uh, the obvious thing is you, you can go through the top navigation um, links in this top menu. For example, um, through the data tab, there's also a search box that you can uh, use to enter your search terms. So pretty easy. Um, uh, when you get your res search results, uh, you will see a page like this. Uh, and you have, uh, there are a lot of things you can do on the search results page. Um, you can go between these three tabs 
for studies, data-related publications, and variables. On the studies tab, for example, uh, you can filter your results further uh, by using these filters on the left-hand side. There's also this uh, sliding uh, button uh, that you can use to add uh, study summaries, study descriptions to your search results, which is really convenient. Uh, you, you won't need to leave this page to learn about this data. Uh, so again, uh, this tab for data-related publications will, uh, will give you your uh, publications that have been returned um, as search results, and you can see links here to related data uh, that, you can, that you can check out as well. And on the variables tab, you can explore variables, but you also can select and compare variables side by side, which is also a very useful feature. Uh, when you click on the study name, let's say on the search results page, you will be taken to uh, a page we call study homepage, which, will, uh, which provides study level metadata, very useful information. And this is how this page uh, will look like, for example, here uh, with the GSS um, with Arts Module 2016 as an example. Uh, the study homepage also provides links to uh, download data and documentation. If you're interested um, in online analysis, uh, you can use this uh, button to get to our online analysis system. I should also remind you, again, going back to the download links here, that all data in NADAC are public use data. Anyone with interest in uh, research and culture can come to the NADAC site and download this data to your computer to do your own uh, exploration and analysis. Back to the online analysis here. Uh, so again, clicking on this bu button will take you to our online an analysis system called SDA, Study Documentation and Analysis. Uh, and you can do a lot of things in SDA. It allows to run frequencies, uh, create statistical tables or cross tabs. You can work with correlations, compare means, uh, create and record variables, and much more. So when you get to SDA, uh, this is what it would, will look like. Um, you can continue to explore variables here um, and select those that you need for your analysis. In my example here, again, I'm using GSS with Arts Module 2016. Um, I determined, so let's say, okay, in my example, uh, I'm, uh, I would like to know how many respondents said that they attended an arts exhibit uh, in the last 12 months. And I also want to know whether they attended alone with, or with uh, other people. So uh, I determined that the variable that I need is, oops, sorry, um, is this art at, uh, arts attendance variable, which asks that particular question. So uh, when I know which variable I'm going to be using for my analysis, I can enter it here in the box on the left-hand side. Uh, and I can send my variable to a row or a column uh, on this uh, right-hand side. Here I can also um, add my controls or filters or weights as I did in my case. In this area here, I can specify my table and chart preferences. And when I'm done with my selections, I can run, uh, I can run my table by clicking on this button. And I'm taking to my um, uh, research results, results uh, of my analysis here, I can see that um, about 77% 7 of respondents said that they attended an arts uh, exhibit alone in the past 12 months. About 45%, significantly larger number of people said that they attended with one other person, which I guess, you know, makes sense. Uh, and uh, about 48% said that they attended with two, two or more other people. SDA also produces a chart uh, to help me vis visualize my results. And I can uh, copy and paste this output into a document if I, if I want to. When you receive your slides, uh, feel free to check out this link to learn more about online data analysis with SDA. Uh, in NADAC, we are always looking for new data to add to our archive. So, if you have data or know of uh, an existing or new data collection, which you think should be archived in NADAC, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to talk to you about it. Um, all new uh, deposits uh, will, re will be reviewed by the National Endowment for the Arts for inclusion in NADAC. And if selected, uh, your data sets will be curated and disseminated 
free of charge through NADAC. And uh, there are a lot of benefits uh, in depositing your data with NADAC. Uh, your data will be reviewed and enhanced by professional curators. Uh, we will be releasing your data with complete suite of data files in multiple formats and technical documentation to ensure the optimal usage of your data. Um, your data will be uh, searchable, your data sets and variables and metadata will be searching, uh, searchable on the uh, NADAC website. Your data will be assigned a persistent, unique persistent identifier or DOI, and we will work on ensuring the long-term preservation and uh, usability of your data. And 24-7, uh, you will be uh, able to access usage uh, information for your data, how many times uh, your data has been downloaded uh, or accessed, how many publications came out based on your data. Uh, all this useful information, especially if you need to report something like this to uh, a funder. And when you're ready to deposit your data, uh, you can go through this uh, link uh, on our website, deposit. Uh, and you will be taken to a secure space in uh, the ICPSR deposit manager, which will look like this. And here you can describe your data and upload your data files. When you get your slides again, uh, please feel free to check out these guidelines on depositing uh, your data with NADAC for more information. And of course, we're excited to share uh, and talk to you about new additions uh, coming to NADAC, like the new data coming to our archive in the near future. Uh, this includes supplemental survey of household economics and uh, decision making or SHED data from April 2020. We will be working on uh, uh, disseminating uh, annual arts basic survey ABS 2020. And as Lynette mentioned, uh, I think uh, we will be also releasing arts and culture uh, production satellite account additional um, uh, years of data 2018-2019. We are also working on adding a new resource to the NADAC website, Arts Quarterly, Arts Research Quarterly, uh, a quarterly digest of arts research articles and reports. Uh, Sunil, would you like to uh, say a few words about the digest? Oh, yeah. just, just, I think one of the undervalued uh, segments of NADAC, and I, I just have, can't say this enough, I mean, this is all free uh, to the public or it's intended to be free for users. So just even if you don't belong, have an institutional subscription, you, know, you can be working independently, you know, or in your organization, and you can download all these materials. But the research quarterly, one thing that people may not know is, on if you go to our, the publications page that I think you showed on our, on our, on the NADAC website, you can actually see a running tab uh, by currency of publications articles that cite data in NADAC. So that's been that's really a kind of a good log of peer-reviewed literature, primarily about the arts. Uh, that as, at least as far as the data set holdings are concerned. That said, we've been wanting to expand and uh, we wanted to put out this or try it uh, out next year, a sort of quarterly roundup of articles that maybe not exclusively from peer reviewed literature and not exclusively about the NADAC data sets. So in fact, topical, topically valuable arts research publications or evidence-based uh, publications, we would want to round up and present to the public through this uh, this resource and it would just kind of probably provide the abstracts at a minimum for those articles uh, or reports. Um, but you know, it could be a way of us collectively building a field here. As many people who study the arts know, uh, you know, we're we're often a siloed bunch, uh, people coming from different disciplines or organization types. So we want to kind of at least start to corral some of the best research out there about the arts as it comes out. So on a quarterly basis. Thanks a lot, Anna. Thank you, Sunil. Um, in conclusion here, uh, I'd like to tell you about the available help resources on our site. And again, for your convenience here, when you get the slides, these links will take you to uh, FAQs and video tutorials uh, on our website. There are also uh, links to past uh, NADAC webinars that you can check out. And of course, user support, our email and phone number uh, on your screen. You can reach out to our professional user support staff for uh, with any questions about uh, NADAC data. 
uh, how to use our, our website uh, with, uh, for help with understanding the research data archived in NADAC and so on. Uh, so our email is icpsr-help at umesh.edu or you can call us at 734-647-2200. So this concludes our presentation and uh, it's time to see if we have any questions. Thanks, Anya. Um, we've been watching the questions and a couple have come in. I would encourage anyone else who has questions to um, include them in the Q&A box. Um, the first one, Sunil and I are gonna sort of tag team. Uh, there's a question about um, what kinds of things can be deposited into NADAC. And so specifically about um, data sets that are kind of constantly in flux or um, iterate uh, different iterations of the data sets. So I can talk about ICPSR's um, uh, stance on versioning and things like that. But first, I thought it would be helpful to hear from Sunil kind of the, the things that you look for um, when you're evaluating a data set to be included in NADAC. Right, and, uh, and I have to say, despite all the hard efforts of the ICPSR team and the arts endowment staff, as you probably can gather even from what we've shared, uh, this is by no means yet comprehensive to the extent that it fully can be. So there's a lot of aspirational work in really mining, and we actually have a running catalog of arts data sets uh, that we often will issue when we put out our research guideline applications, or sorry, guidelines for research grant applications, because we want, we want the field to be aware of all the, the variety of arts variables that exist in national level, state level, local data sets. Um, and you know, it's very hard to inventory that uh, consistently and to keep it up to date, but this is a good effort. Um, I would say that um, we look for research that may not, it may not be predominantly about the arts, although we welcome things like, for example, Americans for the Arts has deposited data here from its um, arts indicators project, local arts indicators project. Um, and I think their National Arts Indicators Project. Uh, we are interested in things that have, that can tell us something uh, about the arts. So, I mean, that's a very broad remit, but, you know, primarily coming from fields of social sciences or rather for the use of social science researchers, economics researchers, policy researchers in various areas um, and for students. So that's, a, like I said, it's a pretty broad remit, but the topic has to do with arts and culture and culture itself is a broad frame, of course. Uh, but when we talk about um, the arts disciplines, artistic disciplines, or arts areas of practice, or arts education, uh, we're interested in all of the above. Um, and so we're always on the lookout for data sets that may be associated with one-time survey or one-time program evaluation, or may in fact um, have to do with a larger, more nationally representative survey, such as the kind we featured, we've tended to feature in this presentation right now. I will just quickly say that um, we have limited resources as does everyone else. So we, we, I think we have a, a ceiling on the number of uh, data sets we can convert for free and put up on this uh, archive. So we encourage you to get in your suggestions so that we can review them. And then we usually make a decision every year in consultation with the ICPSR team on which data sets to actually uh, import. So with that, I'll take it, I'll turn it back to Lynette to answer the nuances of, about the nuance of uh, iterative data sets. Actually, before that, um, there was a follow-up question that I'm going to turn over to you because it fits with what you just said, um, which is, is NADAC um, only interested in survey data or is qualitative data also of interest? We are very interested in qualitative data. I won't uh, put on, uh, mis I won't mislead you by saying this is predominantly qualitative data. I think we'd welcome many, many more. And, you know, over time, maybe even artifacts, you know, actual, you know, data of artifacts kind of like museums often maintain. Um, but I think what we're talking about here is definitely expanding the qualitative, well-coded qualitative data, um, you know, even video, you know, other outlet, other ways of recording, you know, maybe ethnography. Um, we certainly want to include more links. So we have something called a data catalog, a union catalog, which is a link of all these data sets, uh, links to all these data sets. But then the actual data sets that are housed at NADAC, I think we want more qualitative data for sure. But yes, I would say right now, if you looked at it, there's probably much more quantitative. And I would echo that and say that um, ICPSR is continuing to build our capabilities in terms of um, tagging and handling and putting out qualitative data as well. So uh, qualitative data um, to come through NADAC also. 
Um, in terms of uh, the question that was asked about our only final data sets um, taken in to NADAC, um, this is sort of a, uh, an ICPSR um, bigger question, um, which is we do take data sets that are iterative and often, um, and we take data sets in a couple different ways. So if it comes in through NADAC or um, I would also encourage, uh, as Sunil pointed out, they have a limited budget, um, but uh, you can also deposit to the main ICPSR um, that could then get cross-listed into NADAC, um, as well as we have a self-publishing archive. Um, and in each of those, it records versioning of the different data sets and what changes between each version. So, um, and I know that uh, the we actually did some uh, work on it and released a second version. So um, iterative data are um, more than welcome, um, whether they come in through uh, NEA and, and the NADAC site specifically, or um, through open ICPSR, which is our self-publishing um, archive, or through the main ICPSR catalog um, that are then uh, curated by um, funds from our member institutions and available to member institutions. Um, but we would be able to, uh, to associate them with NADAC um, through a cross listing. I, I do see another question. Um, is cross national or cross cultural data eligible for inclusion? Um, I think that just as I was talking about, we want to expand to qualitative data. I will say it would be really nice to be able to bring in more international arts data sets. I will say though that Right now, I think the priority will be if there's at least some US component in that. Um, if, it was, if it were you know, exclusively um, non-US data, uh, while we would be very interested, I think we'd have to look at what else, you know, what it competes with in terms of what we would put up for free. So um, that's why we would love, to, we'd welcome all submissions so we have an opportunity to really delve into what the pros and cons would be of adding different data sets. Um, but for now, I would certainly say, yes, we are open very much so to international um, data sets about arts and culture with the hope that some of that international includes in the U.S. component. And ICPSR users are always looking for international data, so. <laughs> yeah, and we wouldn't want to limit ourselves, certainly, with the user community. So um, we know that a lot of times arts researchers truly benefit from sometimes studies that can't be conducted in the US or have not been supported in the US, but that are extremely valuable to watch abroad. And so I would say as a point blank, please don't let the fact that this is a US housed repository deter you from submitting if you are come calling in from another country or would like to submit data from another country. Thank you. And I think the, the Dunham data is another good example of that as it, um, as it follows her travels worldwide. So it's not just um, US based data. There is a question in chat. Um, how do depositors get credit for the, the data they collect when they use um, NADAC? Um, oh, and I just got the unstable message. So if I go away, know that I'll be back. Um, uh, depositors get credit because, um, as Anya mentioned, uh, each of the ICPSR and NADAC study homepages um, include the uh, download counts. Um, so depositors um, data, um, as well as um, some characteristics about uh, what they download um, and uh, if they're at member institutions where they are. Also, um, ICPSR is a leader in um, data citation. And so we try to make it as easy as possible, as in we try to make you trip over it every single time you turn around. Um, we give you the data citation and we ask that you cite the data anytime that you use it. And that helps depositors as well because um, we can then collect those uh, citations into our bibliography um, and point to the data, which then get the circle that kind of feeds itself. But um, depositors are often often uh, interested in what kinds of things get written on their data. Um, and because they're uh, linked on the study homepage, um, that's a, a benefit to depositors as well. And we also give, um, we also automatically give a, a persistent identifier that Anya mentioned. Um, so the depositor can use that to show that their funder or 
um, a journal editor or whoever else um, that they have shared their data, which obviously um, meets a lot of uh, national government requirements these days. And I think that may be all the questions. Well, could you actually talk about a question came up in the Q&A that's being answered um, through typing, but it says, would NADAC consider data about the use of the arts in healthcare, for example, music and dance and therapeutic settings? Absolutely. And those of you who've watched uh, the research work of the Arts Endowment unfold in the last few years, you'll see that we're highly involved in research about the arts and health and well-being and you know, creative arts therapies, uh, arts in healthcare settings, kinds of interventions, and even, you know, psychological health and well-being. So I think there's, that's a very rich field which we could continue to build on, certainly with our own, with NADAC. I think if you probably, you know, you, one of the surveys that was discussed, one we're really proud of having uh, collect, you know, collected is, um, you know, a project that was done through one of our NEA research labs. And I have to credit Jennifer, Jennifer Novak Leonard and her amazing team uh, who did the, some work on self-perceptions of creativity and, um, and, 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 and that's, although that's not ostensibly a health data set, I did want to point out that we probably see a lot more potential now for psychology oriented studies and research tools to be posted here, data sets and the like, and, and of course health. Um, and right now I would say we don't have a lot of that. So we're hoping to move in that direction as well beyond simply secondary data sets that we find through our federal partnerships or that have been coming over the transom to us. So. Um, certainly we'd be open to, and again, suggestions are welcome. And a lot of it has to do with getting, obviously, you know, being able to de-identify uh, folks, which ICPSR makes sure about in terms of their standards, but um, making sure we have uh, aggregate data to, you know, that with the, and that, you know, that there's data integrity. So a lot of that work that we, we have ICPSR uh, to do for us as part of this arrangement um, can be really beneficial. So I would urge you to think about arts and health or any domain of interest, uh, what kinds of data sets we might be able to post for general public consumption. And I think that was one of the topics that you were interested in having on the digest of articles that are um, may or may not be specifically related to NADAC data as well. Yeah, and I want to kind of invite those of you who are here, uh, you're obviously, if you're stuck, stuck on, if you stayed on with this webinar, you've clearly you're interested in this at some level. So I would urge you uh, when we do have the arts quarterly uh, roundup uh, feature on our website or on the NADAC website starting sometime in next year, early next year, uh, look at that. And you're probably aware of studies maybe that are not being featured or ideas for how we're presenting it. We'd welcome all of that input uh, directly to NADAC or to myself and the NEA team so that we can uh, improve that process so we get to a point where every quarter you have a sort of a very a fairly accurate read of what are readout of what are the top studies and journal papers that have been issued about the arts. Thanks. Was that our last question, Annette? Um, is there a last? Oh, um, social media is considered a creative art. How would influencers? Um, Shown up, show up in any of these surveys. That's really, a really good yeah. I think I think there, it, so. Th there's obviously a lot of, uh, and we've we've even attempted in some of our reports to operationalize and explain what we mean by the arts when it comes to research. But um, I would say that social media, oftentimes, it can be used as a platform for uh, engaging with the arts or about the arts, but. If social media itself were perceived as an expression of the arts or, or a form of artistic expression, uh, I think it depends on the context of the study. Um, if that is a particular dimension of a study and we have good data on that aspect of social media, by all means, we'd be interested in including that. Um, or if it's about social media being used to express or communicate or share the arts, we're interested in that. I don't think though that this would be a repository for everything under the sun that's about social media because it really depends on the context of social media in that particular study and whether it's being used or consciously in some artistic way, uh, or if it's being used to express or convey arts or deliver arts or to engage people about the arts. 
Hope that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Um, I will and... say, sorry, I just want to quickly say, of course, many people out there will know that, uh, you know, whether it's Twitter account, Twitter feeds, or you know, other social media outlets, we there's there's real growing use, and it's gotten pretty sophisticated how researchers can mine these data to tell us more about the communities or the people or the organizations or networks that are putting out the you know those those out you know putting out expressing themselves through social media. So we do see social media as a great resource and a great data source in its own right. Um, it, again, it depends if it's topically related to the arts or not. And I believe I've heard rumors that ICPSR is um, working on a social media data archive as well. So um, we too are interested in that kind of thing and, and aware of the role that it can play in, in research. Um, noting that we are almost out of time, I want to say a super um, big thank you to Anya um, for putting this together and um, doing most of the presentation work, to David for um, the work that he has consistently done on NADAC, um, particularly on the data side, um, and to Susan Leonard and Amy Pienta, who have um, been the, the NADAC directors um, up until now. Uh, they know much more about this than I do, um, but hopefully I will get there. So thank you, thank you, thank you Anya you. and um, Sunil for participating in the webinar. And, and I just, last note, uh, somebody, uh, put in the chat, uh, TikTok is creative. And that's a very fair point. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not plugging them. I'm just saying what somebody did. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. And uh, we hope that you enjoyed today's presentation. We hope that it, we inspired you to uh, explore NADAC further and maybe find ways to draw your own portrait of arts and culture with public data in our archive or you'll come to uh, NADAC to learn about recent research on arts and culture or for interesting facts about arts. Um, please feel free to reach out to us. We're here to support and help you. Um, thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.